few car companies, maybe with the exception of Honda, have achieved motorsport success with such a breadth of machinery as BMW. From Formula One to Le Mans, touring cars to Formula E and even on two wheels, the German manufacturer has won in everything it's turned its hands to. But as it pioneers into another era of motorsport with an LMDH program to race at Le Mans, which cars can be seen as its greatest inspirations? Here's eight possibilities. And if you do enjoy this video, and you watch it and think, oh, I remember that, I loved that, please just remember to give it a like. And then subscribe to the channel and hit that bell icon to make sure you see absolutely everything from Goodwood Road and Racing on YouTube. Two BMW lists this close together, just as we've celebrated the legendary M division at the festival of speed? Well, that means there's a couple of repetitions. But each one is justified. The BMW 328 is perhaps the genesis of every other BMW racing car to come, yeah, and a few from other manufacturers. In fact, the BMW 328 may be the most successful racing car of the 1930s. In 1937 alone, it took 100 separate class victories. That's why 464 were built between 1936 and 1940. Frankly, anyone who had a brain wanted one. It weighed just 780 kilograms and had 80 horsepower from its 2-litre straight six. Boxy now, but back then, commendable. The winning, well, that began straight away. Class win in its first race, the daunting Eiffelrennen of the Nürburgring. Then came the RAC TT in 1937 and 1938. It won the Osterreich Alpenfahrt and the La Turbie Hill Climb in 1937. In 1938, it added the Alpine Rally before adding the 1939 RAC Rally and the Le Mans 24 Hours. It was a jack of every single trade and a master of all of them. But the Mille Emilia was the 328's real home. It won its class in 1939, and then two years later, in 1940, as bombs fell across Europe, the BMW 328 won the entire thing with an average speed of 103.6 miles an hour. As if to prove that it was always a decent machine, a full 12 years after it was launched, the BMW 328 won the Australian Grand Prix. And, as a final crown to its achievements, a 328 Fraser Nash was Sterling Moss's first ever racing car. To some, a Batmobile is all black, and it's covered in reasonably pointless afterburners and it's able to drive Batman through gaps it shouldn't. Kind of depends on which generation of films you're watching. But to us, it's in a red, blue and purple striped white BMW motorsport livery with a wing on the rear and roof and a big old chin. This is where BMW's M division started, being tasked with taking the svelte but forgettable E9 coupe and making it to something that could win the European Touring Car Championship. And boy, did they manage and not just managed to make a winning car, but a truly desirable one. 1,039 Batmobiles were made for its homologation, each taking the outline of the E9 and turning it into an altogether more meaningful visage. The additions were meaningful too, with the wing and body kit adding around 90 kilograms of downforce in a day when that kind of thing was still a bit of a mystery. Complete with thinner steel in its monocoque and aluminium additions, the Batmobile could hit 60 miles an hour in 6.8 seconds. BMW competition cars made 300 horsepower, about 90 more than the road car, and were almost unstoppable across Europe. In 1973 and 74, the Batmobile won the 24 Hours of Le Mans touring car class, and it won the European Touring Car Championship every year but one from 1973 to 1979. It had global success too. The 3 litre CSL would race in the 1975 IMSA GT Championship, winning several races with drivers including Brian Redman and Ronnie Peterson. The upgraded Group 5 3.5 CSL also won three extra races in the European Championship for makes. M Division's first ground-up built car, and its last until the XM arrives later this year, was as iconic as it was short-lived and birthed possibly the greatest one-make series of all time. We're very sorry, Clio Cup, but you're gonna have to stand aside. This is the M1 Pro Car. The M1 was originally built to comply with sports cars Group 4 regulations and featured a 477 horsepower straight six. Later versions, developed up to Group 5 regulations, were boosted to 860 or, in some cases, over a thousand horsepower. 
That iconic wedge was designed by Giorgio Giugiaro, and the road car was originally going to be built by Lamborghini before holdups meant that BMW took manufacturing in-house. The Pro car would hit 193 miles an hour and was blessed with a deep nose spoiler, adjustable rear wing, and bespoke suspension anti-roll bar steering and brakes over the road car. While the car would never actually race in Group 4, BMW created the M1 Pro Car Series specifically for it, a mind-blowing mix of F1 drivers and stunning sports cars that raced alongside Formula 1 and featured a qualifying system based on the F1 results. Sadly, it only ran for two years, but the names of its two champions, Nicky Lauda and Nelson Piquet, are a testament to just how awesome those 24 months were. The 2002 was launched in 1968 to be the answer to the post-war doldrums into which BMW had slipped. The little 1600 Ti saloon was blown up to 2 litres by BMW's Alex von Falkenhausen and Helmut Werner Bosch, both working independently. They would eventually join forces, pitch to the board, and the rest is history. The 2002's life was longer than many small saloons, lasting through three different generations from 1968 to 1976. Almost as soon as it was revealed, a racing version arrived, making its debut in 1969 ready to race in the European Touring Car Championship. It would go up against such unlikely competition as the Porsche 911 and win. It would eventually also race in Trans Am's under 2 litre class with little success, but did clinch victory in the 1970 Nürburgring 24 hours. While the 2002's motorsport successes were perhaps a little limited compared to others on this list, it does hold an important place in BMW's motorsport history. This was pretty much the car that relaunched Munich's racing ambitions for real. Before we move on, we'd just like to again say thank you so much for watching this video. We really do appreciate it and remind you that if you are enjoying it, just hit that like button. It all helps us out. Now we'll shut up and move on with the mighty 635 CSI. Like today, Many areas of motorsport in the 1970s began to strongly diverge from what we were seeing on our roads, sort of beginning to nullify the old win on Sunday, sell on Monday adage. To fight this, the FIA brought in stronger homologation rules for its touring car championships, demanding at least 25,000 road cars be built to compete. BMW's answer to this was at first to field an E28 5 Series, the 528, a car which proved wholly uncompetitive against the big Jaguar saloons. Instead, the 635 CSI, which had been around since 1978, was given a fettle, a tune-up, and sent out to win some races. This version was given a 3.5-litre M30 B35 engine, hence the name, tuned by specialists from Alpina and Schrick until it developed 200 horsepower, and Schnitzer would then assemble it into a racing car. Weighing in at just 1,185 kilograms, including the transmission, the 635 easily undercut the big V12-powered Jags. Nimbler and more manoeuvrable, the BMW took six wins to Jaguar's four in 1983 and the title. From then on, well, the winning just kept happening. The 635 CSI won 16 titles in 12 series from 1983 to 1987. This included a second European Touring Car Championship title, the DTM, the Australian Touring Car Championship, two RSE TT wins, three Spa 24 Hours victories, and two victories at the Nürburgring 24. That's not bad for a car that was pretty much five years old before it started racing properly. Ah, for many, this is the king. In fact, so much has been said about the E30 M3 by not just us, but everyone, that actually, We'll keep this section relatively brief. Created for the 1987 World Touring Car Championship, the E30 M3, handed over to Roberto Revalia, won the title straight away. Seven of the 12 races that season went to E30s. The M3 had a raspy 2.3 litre naturally aspirated engine producing around 300 horsepower, enough to win the Nürburgring 24 hours five times and the Spa 24 hours four times against cars with much bigger capacity. Two DTM crowns, four Italian touring car championships, and a duo of BTCC victories showcased just how dominant the E30 was in its day. There was a time in the late 90s when Williams was so good that it dominated in the BTCC, Formula One, and Le Mans pretty much at the same time. Now, why am I mentioning Williams in a video about BMW? 
simply because the last BMW winner of the Le Mans 24 hours, the V12 LMR, was actually built by the team from Grove. The 1998 V12 LM had been a bit of a disaster. So Williams and BMW built a revamped version and added an R for 1999. This had new aero, better cooling in a 6-litre BMW S70 V12 engine. Schnitzer Motorsport ran the team and fielded cars at both Le Mans and in the fledgling American Le Mans series. As much as 1998 had not been BMW's year, 1999 was. The V12 LMR debuted at the Sebring 12 Hours in March, where Tom Christensen, JJ Leto and Jörg Müller took victory. A couple of months later at Le Mans, victory followed for Yannick Dalmas, Pierluigi Martini and Joe Winkelhock. Simple as they only had to defeat the small matter of Mercedes, Audi, Toyota, Panels and Nissan. While it didn't compete in the full ALMS in 1999, it still won three more races in the US. For 2000, the BMW Williams partnership was focusing on F1. But the LMR didn't go to waste. A full season in the ALMS with a barely developed car still brought a runners-up spot just behind the brand new Audi R8. The last time BMW had a proper go at the top level of single-seater motorsport was back in 2008. Sure, it poured a lot of cash into its 2009 car, but it abandoned the whole project. 2008 was its big chance. The F108 was a development of the 2007 car, featuring aero adjustments including a brand new front wing and revised side pods to bring cleaner airflow to the rear. After a handful of podiums and pole positions for Nick Heidfeld and Robert Kubica, the F108's finest moment came in the Canadian Grand Prix. A year on from a horror crash that could very easily have caused great damage to the pole, he won his first ever F1 race, completing a 1-2 miles clear of the rest of the field. From then, it's a bit of a what-if story. That decision to send bucket loads of money into the development team for 2009 pretty much pulled all the cash from development of the 08 car. And it was made quite early in the season. BMW had decided that it was just not competitive enough against Ferrari and McLaren. When the decision was made, Robert Kubica had won a race and was actually challenging for the 2008 championship. Kubica still argues today that he could have won the title had BMW just put money in place to develop it. The fact that Lewis Hamilton and Felipe Massa just kept throwing cars at each other in the wall kind of suggests that he might have been right. The 2009 car? Well... That was a disaster. Such a disaster that it ended the entire BMW F1 program. Will we ever see them back? Who knows? Those then are eight of BMW's historical racing cars that we absolutely adore. But which one's your favorite or what have we missed out? Let us know in the comments below.